Hello everybody, this is Graham and today I'm going to be looking at a game called Freya. Now this game is set on the floating market in Thailand on the Freya River, and I'm hoping I'm pronouncing that correctly, I'm not sure. Each player takes on the role of merchants to buy and sell food stuff, while of course watching the market because you never want to pay too much for your food. You want to go around and fulfill orders at the restaurants and buying stalls to build up your market reach. Of course you'll also want to be making offers to the temples and hopefully present some really nice stuff to the king to get his favor. Now the game uses actually several mechanisms that are all put together that we have seen in other games. There's kind of a market speculation and manipulation part. Will you be altering the cost of food to try and, you know, of course, buy low and sell high? You'll be doing some pick up deliver. You're going to be collecting those foods to hopefully cheaply to fulfill restaurant orders. And finally, it incorporates hand management, where once you play a card, you can't play it again until you take a round to collect all your previously played cards. And of course, you also have the opportunity to add some more cards to your hand to get kind of in game bonuses and end of game scoring. So the theme is a very interesting one, and it has a lot of mechanisms that I really enjoy in other games, but does it all come together in a watertight game, or will it just sink to the bottom of the river? Let's get it to the table, see how it's played, and we'll come back for my final thoughts on Freya. Here is Freya set up. The board is pieced together in a random fashion with the royal barge in the middle. Place the tracks board to one side and set the starting prices for the meat, fish, fruit, and vegetables with your cubes. Shuffle the cards and place them on the board, and then draw the top four cards. The royal favor tokens go here, and the extra rowers here. The merchant starts here. The restaurant order tiles are sorted by their backs, and starting with the lowest ones, fill up the order stations on the board. The basket tiles go in the bag, and randomly draw and fill basket spots on the board. Money and flower tokens are placed to one side. Each player takes a boat and the matching pieces. The first player gets 8 coins, then each subsequent player gets one more coin than the previous player. In player order, players will place their boat token in a canal section connected to the outside border. Then in reverse player order, they will place one of their stalls on a vacant good stall. The game is played over a number of rounds until two out of the three possible endgame conditions are met. The royal tithe is complete, Buddha is properly worshipped, or the market supremacy is achieved. When two of those three are done, the player with the most points will be the winner. On a player's turn, they must play a card, and you'll carry out the effects shown on the card. You must then move your boat at least one channel, and take actions depending on the shops beside your boat. So let's take a closer look at these steps. The first is playing a card. You can play any card from your hand, and you cannot use that card again until it's back into your hand. You start the game with five cards, and one of them is the Recall All Your Cards card. Three of your starting cards are very similar, and they have to do with manipulating the market. The top shows how many spaces you must move the merchant. He can move in either direction. The space he lands on will show two different foods. You must move different market values according to the bottom of the card. This one says move one value up one space, that is make it more expensive, and the other one down three steps. Any movement beyond the top or bottom is just ignored. That means you can select to move a food market up even if it's already at its maximum. Another card you have is move the royal barge. This will show you how many steps it has to be moved. The barge moves from intersection to intersection. It will never be in a canal with you. The bottom part of the card says any player that owns a shop that is adjacent to where the barge stops gets a flower token. The final card is the pick up everything card. You move the royal barge one space, owned adjacent shops get a flower token. Then you pick up all your cards, and for every card that you pick up, you also get a coin. Your turn ends, and you do not move your boat, and you do not take further actions. Once you've played your card and done the card action, as long as it wasn't the pick up everything card, you must move your boat at least one channel, and up to a maximum that your ship can go, which is shown by the number of rowers you have, and at the start of the game, it's going to be two. Your boat moves from channel to channel only, and cannot cross the royal barge. When you stop moving, you will interact with the two market stalls on either side of your boat. At a market stall, you can buy or sell goods of the indicated type based on the current market value for those goods. You can only store goods in your boat if you have a matching space in a basket. At a basket stall, you can buy an additional basket for your boat to store more goods. Pay the cost and place it in an empty spot in your boat, then draw a replacement one from the bag. Now instead of buying a basket at a basket stall, you can also hire more rowers. They either cost a meat or a fish. At a restaurant stall, you can deliver goods from your boat that matches the order at that restaurant. Get the coins and keep the order for the end of game scoring, then replace the order with the next one from the lowest stack. At a temple stall, you can make an offering. Choose a good from your boat and look to the leftmost empty spot in that row and pay one good and the number of flowers shown and place one of your markers there. 
These tracks will be used as the end of game trigger and are worth points. Or you could lose points for not having anything on these tracks at the end of the game. At a scribe stall, you can purchase any of the face-up cards for the cost shown above it, either flowers or coins. The purchase cards goes right into your hand. Shift the remaining cards to the left and refill. Finally, the administration stall allows you to claim ownership of a market stall on the board. It costs 10 coins, and you can place your market on any stall that already doesn't have one. When you own a stall, if any other player uses it to purchase or sell goods, you get a flower token. If the royal barge stops at any of the adjoining intersection, you get a flower token. At the end of the game, there'll be points given for the player with a majority of each type of stall. The final action you can do, and this only applies if you ended your movement facing the royal barge, is to make a royal offering. Choose an empty spot on the king's chart and pay the resources and place one of your pieces on it. You'll get the king's flavor token, and these can be used on your turn to either when you make an offering at the temple to ignore the flower requirements, or when you buy goods from a stall, you get an extra good, or when you buy a basket or hire a worker, you can get it for free. When you use this favor token, just return it to the board. The game will end when two of the following three conditions are met. A royal tithe is complete, that is one row of the king's chart is full. There is at least one player disc in the rightmost section of the temple chart, or a player has placed all of their stalls on the board. When two of those three things are done, the game ends immediately. Then move to scoring. For each five coins you have, you get a point. Then the temple scoring. For each of your offerings, score the indicated number of points. Then, for each section on the temple board, determine who has the majority, and they score the majority point. If you have no discs in this section, though, you suffer the penalty and lose points. On the king's chart, whoever has the most tokens and second most will score points, and for each player that has a set of three discs, that is, one in the coin row, one in the flower row, and one in the food row, scores eight points. Score points for your completed orders. Any cards you bought during the game might have end-of-game scoring on them. Then finally determine who owns the majority for each stall type and gets points for the first and second place. And the player with the most points is the winner. Let's get back to see what I thought about Freya. On to the theme and components. You know what? I quite like this theme and it works very, very well with the mechanisms of this game. Moving your boat around to go to different stalls to take actions, you know, to pick up foods and deliver just to make thematic sense on this river-based market. The cards that we need to put the market are, I guess, thematically tied to external influences from different uh, merchants that are going to be altering the market. So all in all, I thought the theme was an interesting one and it worked very well with the mechanisms. On to the components. They were all around good. I have no complaints on anything. I like all the boats on the map. You know, maybe I would have liked to have the food token shaped like the, the pictures in your boat or in your little baskets, but you know what? It's not a big deal. The rulebook does a good job of explaining the game, so, you know, top marks on the components. Maybe not stellar, but a nice solid game. So, onto the gameplay. I was a little worried when I first read the rules. There seemed to be a, several mechanisms going on in this game, and I thought they kind of might trample on each other. Now, luckily, they don't. The market manipulation combined with that buying and selling goods is definitely a pretty large portion of the mechanisms in the game. But the others, like the hand management, works well on its own while still kind of integrating with the other mechanisms. The pick up and deliver, again, works well in support of the other mechanisms, but it never feels like it's that's the only thing you need to be doing. Now, all the mechanisms are also kept fairly light as well. Nothing stands out as overly complex, which, you know, making it makes the teaching of the game definitely easier. And combined with the theme, it's definitely a lot more approachable when I go to teach this game. I think the theme here does a lot of heavy lifting and hiding the mechanisms. Well, in my opinion, that's probably a good thing for it to do. I think for me, the standout mechanism of this game is actually the hand management. Getting extra cards is always one way I enjoy to approach this game. Even if you just get a few, they can offer special abilities when played, and most are worth points at the end of the game, which kind of lets you focus on, oh, I need to get this type of thing so this card will score. You know, getting your card early will definitely guide your strategy. But at the same time, it does take you away from the other aspects of the game, especially early on. But that's why I like how they all work together. There's nothing you do on your turn that is not somehow useful. Even the turn where you pick up your cards, you get coins. And if you can maneuver the royal barge correctly, hopefully you can also get some flowers out of that. At the beginning of the game, you think, oh, what do I need flowers for? But as you come to the temple offering, you definitely need more flowers. Now, there are some negatives to the game. And the two biggest for me are really the game length and the player count. I'll start off with a player count. I found the game, I don't maybe not balanced to the different player counts. At two players, I felt it was too wide open. And I felt there was too little player interaction. I never felt like I was fighting for the temple offerings or the, the king's offerings. 
There was a little competition for the orders, but I never felt any real turn angst worrying that someone was going to cause a huge swing in the market or take all the orders before I could get to them. Now at four players you have the exact opposite. The market swings can be very large between your turns and sometimes you can just get priced out of the market to fulfill your orders and the other things you want to do like the fulfilling temples. Now I did find it best at three. There was enough turn angst between my turns and sometimes I had to pivot strategies but I found I was kind of always in the race for the next thing I wanted to, to fulfill. Either an order or a temple offering or etc. So although they do work at, at two and four, I'd really prefer this game at three. The neg other negative I have is the game length. It just tends to go on a bit longer at all player counts. You get to the point of the game where most if not all the orders are done and now you're just kind of racing to push up the offering tracks. You kind of lose kind of part of the game near the end of the game. You care less about the cost of things, about getting money from orders, and are just trying to get enough money to get your shops out or whatever else is needed for the offerings. I'm not sure how this could be fixed, maybe shortening the tracks to kind of bring that end of game sooner, but I just found the last third to quarter of the game maybe just not as exciting as the first part of the game when everything is kind of wide open for you, you're working on everything. At the end of the game, you're kind of maybe locked into one or two things that you're trying to do. I did find the market mechanism also a little weird in the way it was manipulated by the external forces, you know, those cards that you're playing on your turn, and really not as, not as uh, what's being bought or sold by the players. It did make playing the market a little more nebulous because you couldn't judge the swing of the market by looking at what players needed or had. But then I guess being able to play a card will to hopefully manipulate it back in your favor offset that a little bit. So would I recommend this game? I would. This is a good, solid, maybe not spectacular, but enjoyable game. I really like the theme and how it integrated the mechanisms. I enjoyed how the mechanisms all work together and intertwined, but my favorite was definitely that hand management. You know, playing a card to pick up all your cards is kind of one of my favorite mechanisms out there, and I don't think enough games use that. I liked all the different ways to score points. Now this can be seen as a little overwhelming to some, but I enjoyed all the options I had to try and score points. The little bonuses you get from the extra cards or those royal favors just added a little something to the game that I quite liked. And I liked that I never felt that I was wasting a turn. I always felt I was moving forwards towards whatever my next goal was. But of course, there are some downsides, and it really comes down to just a few. For the game length, I felt the game just went on a little too long for what I would like. The game is definitely best at three, and two and four, it's okay, but I felt it really shown at three. I thought the market manipulation piece was maybe a little too disconnected for what was happening on the board. I also felt that the game really doesn't do enough to make itself stand out. It's an enjoyable, solid game, but I don't see this really being anyone's favorite game because it doesn't do enough to kind of differentiate itself. Overall though, I am going to give this one an 8 out of 10 on Dice Tower Seal of Approval. This is a really solid good game, but it's a good game in a sea of other good games and it just doesn't do quite enough to raise above the rest to become a true hit. But that's it for the moment. Until next time, thanks for watching. Hey everybody, thanks for watching another video on the Dice Tower. Hey, do you want to know what's going on with Dice Tower? Do you want to know about our events, our cruises, special things that we're going to do live during the Dice Tower? Subscribe to Dice Tower Digest. Go to DiceTowerDigest.com. It's a newsletter that we send out bi-weekly. We won't use your email for anything else. It's just to get you some information about the Dice Tower so you'll be up to date. Thanks for watching.